I think we, we, we can uh, start off. Um, we don't mean uh, a very serious, uh, well, we are serious. By the way, don't mean a very serious uh, debate. Um, we actually want a very informal, casual exchange and dialogue. That's why we call it a dialogue. Um, uh, between uh, Professor Scott Ash and Professor Leo Lee. Um, well, I guess I don't have to explain too much their background. Everybody know, know them, right? Uh, Professor Lee uh, is actually most well in Hong Kong now for his music commentary uh, that you see on newspaper. I read that uh, always, when I, uh, now, and I also have music fans as well. Um, and um, uh, he has been uh, serving as a uh, chair professor in the School of in, in the Faculty of Arts, um, independence of any department. So he is a really special uh, chair professor in our universities. Um, and Professor Scott Ash is a uh, visiting professor in our school, and for for how long? For five months already. And and he is going to leave. So before he's leaving, so he proposed that we should um, do something really special um, and try to break the, break the boundary, boundaries between humanities, arts, and social science. So that's why he initiates uh, a topic. He initiates a topic called Conflict of the Families. Um, I don't know what it means, but, um, but we will figure it out. Uh, um, um, I guess both of them have written many, many books. Uh, I don't want to like, like list them here. Um, so why don't we um, have a uh, casual start first by having Scott's presentation. John Ernie at, um, at Baptist. Oh, in fact, that was a great idea. John Ernie. Yeah, it's John Ernie. No, no. no he, he never was going to be able to come because he had a. He's a happy meeting about me. No, he couldn't come, remember, at that dinner. Um, so, uh, let me thought it was a good idea. And actually, it is, I think, perhaps a good idea. Um, and then I didn't know where to start, um, really, uh, because if you just say, oh, social science and humanities should get on better, great, you know. So I thought I'd. Um, I got nervous and I looked up and started having another look at uh, Kant's conflict of the faculties. So maybe I could say something about that, <clears throat> and uh, and then Leo can come in, and then after that, I can say uh, Anthony, and we can all talk informally about these things and maybe talk biographically. Um, but probably more important to uh, to possibly this seems to be a good way in, and seemed to be a way that. That I was nervous about it, so okay, so I prepared. Um, and these are just notes, all my students know already that I just do notes anyway for PPTs, uh, so they're used to it. Um, but the notes are useful a little bit because sometimes there are words and things that you can see in here at the same time. Okay, uh, especially if it's in German or whatever. Conflict of fact, like, should I turn around? I can't see the PPT. Uh, I can see over there. Oh, I can uh, see it over there. <laughs> But the guy's head's in the way. I could also stand up, which I would yeah, 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 yeah. I'm okay. I'll, 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 no, 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 I'm okay with standing up. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna stand, stand up, sort of yeah, personally. We'll, we'll wait for you. Do you mind? No, I'm good standing. Up. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, used to it. Um, right. Okay. There you go. Confident the faculty. So I had a look at. Um, it, I, I thought maybe I could avoid being just ridiculous by looking at saying what can't. And then Jacques Derrida actually wrote a book, or half of a book, called Conflict of the Faculties later on. And um, <clears throat> I, I guess what I'm going to conclude, um, which I'll tell you at the beginning, is something about, uh, I think that 
the, the, neither of them quite say it, neither Derrida or Kant. Kant talks about reason, I think, <clears throat> um, and Derrida talks about justice, or responsibility, responsibility, because I think it's also a reflection on the university, isn't it? You know, what's going on is a reflection on the university and the role of the, um, of the university and the role of CUHK, the role of, um, of the university in an international context in which, um, in which I think Kant was aware of, and surely uh, Derrida later, in which you know, the kind of unipolar uh, world of American power is now becoming much more about a multipolar world because of China, you know, for all our criticism and uh, whatever of China, better to have a multipolar than a unipolar world as both Derrida and Kant were well aware of. I mean, Kant wrote The Conflict of the Faculties at the same time as he wrote pretty much, can you guys see that? Is it too small? Is the print too small? Can you see it? You can see it. Yeah, we can see it. I just wonder. At the same time as he wrote Perpetual Peace, it was his last two books. Perpetual Peace was, you know, about a world, the possibility of cosmopolitan world of perpetual peace between nations. You know, so it was his kind of international relations book, right? Um, and the conflict of the faculties came three years later. It was the last thing he ever wrote, which uh, I don't know how auspicious that is for Leo and me. Uh, maybe the last thing I ever write or say for Leo. Uh, so what's interesting is these two texts were, were incredibly, are, are, are importantly related. Again, it's the guy from Baptist that writes about this, um, um, Stephen, Stephen Palmquist. You know, whenever I'm trying to figure out what to write and give for a lecture on, I Google it and I see Stephen Palmquist, and so I always draw him. He's very good from Baptist University, I'm kind of, kind of scholar. Um, the point is that, um, I mean, <clears throat> that the, um, the conflict of the faculties is the conflict between the higher faculties, Kant wrote, and then the lower faculty. In those days, there weren't departments. It was just faculties. Um, and there wasn't the modern university, there wasn't the research university or anything like that. 1798, Germany, right? Prussia, Prussia. No Germany yet, right? Just Prussia. And um, the, the, the higher faculties were, he called the higher faculties, theology, medicine, and law. There wasn't like a science those days or anything. And the lower faculty was philosophy. And I think philosophy then spreads to include things like natural philosophy, which then become the sciences. But um, the higher faculties of theology, medicine, and law, partly because they are, um, they produce for the professions. Yeah. You know, I mean, Oxford and Cambridge are very much like that, of course, there are other faculties too. Um, but um, the higher faculties are producing for the professions. And indeed, the um, they come about because, I mean, there's nothing natural about a university, as we know. Universities are always under threat. I mean, as we know, the, once the schools of philosophy are, you know, kind of closed, really, by dogmatic Christianity about the fourth century AD, we have really in the West, you know, the other schools and universities starting in about 900 years later. So, you know, universities and schools are very are precarious things. You know, we can't just take them for granted. Well, you guys probably know more than anybody that we can't take them for granted. Um, but but, but the, the, the university starts because the Prussian bureaucracy gets massive in Prussia. Prussia gets strong, bureaucracy gets massive. The university produces people for the state. Yeah. Um, lawyers, all these people are part of the state in Germany as they are maybe in China in a certain sense, not very much less here. Um, and um, I mean, it makes you think also, the Confucian bureaucracy and this kind of thing, and the Han Dynasty, which is you know, 1,500, 1,200 years, before, 1,400 years before the Prussian bureaucracy. China came first a lot of these things, but slightly differently. Um, okay, so you know, the medicine was to look after physical well-being, um, law was to look after civic well-being, and especially property and property disputes. This is law and then uh, theology about spiritual well-being. I think what I'm trying, what I'm going to argue is that, is that the conflict of the faculties is about potentiality. It's about potentiality. I think Kant, when he argues for reason, and in particularly the, pos the, the position of philosophy vis-a-vis -vis the higher faculties, yeah? So philosophy can criticize, right? 
these higher faculties, which are professions and of use to the state. Right? Yeah. Um, um, and, and, and Derry Dell, when he talks about the responsibility of the university, and then he talks about responsibility in the context of justice, yeah? and justice, of course, is the undeconstructible, you know, for Derry Dell. Um, I, I think in both cases, what we're talking about is potential somehow, or potentiality. Human potentiality, but maybe not just human potentiality. Um, I think that's what might be going on in some of this conflict of the faculties. Um, potentiality versus, um, versus what is, versus lawfulness, versus um, the actual, what's going on, not criticism, you know, but, but what is working for the Prussian state at that moment for Kantel, right? Law, uh, theology, and, um, and, and medicine. The, 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 um, the context of this is, is the beginning of the Prussian University. I mean, Kant was one of the first professional philosophers. Philosophers were not in the university very much before. He was a civil servant, for God's sake. You know, when I got a job, for a while, I was offered a job in, in, in a German university. You're a civil servant. I don't know if it's in France, too, of course. In China, I don't know exactly what it's like. But um, in any case, I was a civil servant. And, and then the funny thing was, he was res, res, he, he was given a salary. These guys didn't have salaries before. You know, they were paid by they were paid by what you know, they used to call her or guild. You turn up the lecture, you pay, and he got some of the money. But but that wasn't what it was like. I mean, it was salaries. And so this same state, the Prussian state that creates Kant's job, then kind of hammers him. Hammers him when he talks about religion. And this is the, the, um, the uh, context of the conflict of the faculties, is that Kant writes religion, a piece of 1782, religion within the bounds of mere reason. Not pure reason, but mere blos, blos ferment, blos ferment, mere reason. Sassy, I think, is in um, Australia or something. Oh, you just, she's just, just back. back. Okay, just well, back. I, I get to ask lots of friends without Sassy here. But I'll tell her, too. But, but she was, like he's not in German. Oh, Liliana is German, for God's sake, but not the rest of them. Most of them don't. Blows of friends. Mere, mere reason. Okay. Um, so the point is, is that um, Kat, Kat looks at religion from the point of view of philosophy. The king of Prussia gets really heavy. The king, not just some guy. The king of Prussia says to Kant, you cannot publish on religion again. And I think this lasts for about six years. And I think just as he writes the book, the edict of the king is taken back. But nonetheless, it's a threat. You know, don't publish on this, dude. You can't do it. I mean, it's not like China or wherever. I don't know, in some ways. Um, so OK. But, and so Kant was defending the right of philosophy to criticize theology, to criticize religion. That's what was at stake concretely when he writes this. Um, Garrity gives his paper, it's interesting, 1980 at UNESCO. So it's about international relations in the United Nations. Kant's perpetual peace is a bit of a foundation for the United Nations, for international law. Yeah, which isn't just a question of multipolarity, but some kind of some kind of law, you know, that that's that's reached starting with conflict in each case. So nations are naturally in conflict, but at a certain point through some kind of negotiation, you can get beyond the conflict to reason and something maybe like perpetual peace. And he lists a set of rules, like for example, the state is not allowed to go into debt to finance war. Well, nobody ever nobody ever followed that. You know. And the British and the French state an enormous debt, you know, for their wars about 300 years ago. But in, in, any, in, any, in any event, um, the, 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 the perpetual peace and the conflict of the faculties were linked together. Um, conflict or, or opposition is at the heart of Kant's philosophy. In the first place, you have perception or feeling on the one hand, right? And then the intellect or the understanding on the other. That's a conflict. That's what gives you knowledge, right? Um, without either, you can't have knowledge. Um, um, so there's conflict at the start. Nations are naturally in some kind of conflict, and they surmount this self-interest, from self-interest to reason, to enlightenment. Okay. 
Okay, Pat said the higher faculties are about men, and the fullest philosophical faculty is about man. Men meaning what people do, you know, theology, um, practice, these kind of everyday practices, but not everyday practices necessarily in a good sense. Everyday practices they're not as they're tied into the state, as they're tied into the Prussian state, as they're tied into the Prussian bureaucracy. Because theologians are, theologians are part of the bureaucracy. There are Protestant theologians that are part of the bureaucracy. State church, who's and, um, and then Kant, so the idea was that, and then man is about potential. And the idea of human, human, humankind, and human potential. So that was the, that was the concept of the faculties largely. Okay, and also law is actual, justice for the <coughs> as potential. The is here versus the potential, critique and justice. But that may take us back to maybe contemporary stuff, you know, um, and, and, and social sciences versus the humanities. I'm not sure because humanities aren't always critical, as we know. In fact, they're often just traditional. Okay. Um, but what's interesting is you look at a couple of the, in Germany again, or too German, I'm afraid, um, you know, the two, there are two huge, two, math, two big methodological debates, methodisch, I'd say, methodological debates. The more recent one is 60s, 70s, the positivismus streit, which is Adorno and then Habermas, right, um, who were criticizing positivism, right, in the social sciences. It wasn't necessarily the humanities that were going to say this, I mean, but it was critical thought. Yeah. So I think at stake here with potentiality is not just humanities, but critical thought, perhaps, you know, in general. Um, the other method in streit was Max Weber, actually, 50 or 60 years earlier. And I think that's important uh, because it was um, Max Weber, um, sociologist, you know, the birth of real sociology. And in this case, it's kind of more positivist side you know, of Weber, because he's both, of course. But he's in alliance with Karl Menger in the Methoden Strike. Karl Menger is the guy that invents neoclassical economics. So the kind of neoclassical economic actor, neoliberalism now, preference schedules, utility scales, uh, it, that, that kind of, all that stuff, utility functions, come originally from neoclassical, not classical, neoclassical economics, and Menger, and Weber were together on this, <clears throat> in making assumptions about the human actor. Yeah, that kind of was also about positivism. The enemy in this case was the historical school, but the historical school was not critical. It was kind of traditional humanities. Yeah. So, okay. So this is the kind of frame. The role of the university, we talked about that a little bit. Um, I mean, we, and, and, and you know, Darian talked about the university and responsibility. I think that's a hugely important thing. The question is, who is the university responsible to? Um, at the moment, we have accountability, totally. unfortunately. The whole research exercise framework and research, RAE, and you know, all this cal calculus. You know, you know, what kind of university is this you know, that we're in? You know, have we already lost in both the humanities and the social sciences is the question we want to ask in terms of that kind of responsibility, which is showing not what these guys are on about at all. Um, should I go five more minutes? <laughs> I, I don't know. Ten more? I don't want to go very long. We started how long ago? Only 40, 20 minutes? 15 or 20, okay. Um, right, one th okay, here's my thought, one thought that I've had that my students and everybody here and, and others will probably know will get be a little bit sick and tired of, but anyway, I'll say it. Um, it's, um, what's interesting is that, um, you know, when, when Kant talks about um, the, the role of philosophy, and then he talks about law, um, and in a sense, he says philosophy can teach morality to law, you know, can teach morality to law. And, um, and, and this bridging of morality and law will lead to something else. And this something else is judgment. This something else is judgment, okay? It's something, judgment and even justice, possibly. And, and he even talks, you know, he, he says, oh, we can't do, do this from experience, but then he refers to the French Revolution. And he says the French Revolution is this experience that has given us something to think about things like civic justice, 
you know, decided by the collectivity you know, of the French people, 1789, right? Which was a huge thing, too. three years before he writes his religion piece, the French Revolution, 1789. So um, this bridge between morality on the one hand and law on the other to give you justice, um, you know, reminds me of, well, it, it, it's Kant's critiques, which I keep talking about. Um, you know, and the, the first critique, which is the cognitive reason, about a cognitive reason, you, it, 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 can, it becomes instrumental rationality, yeah? It's not just instrumental rationality, but it's a priori is what Kant calls Gesetzlichkeit, lawfulness, yeah? Lawfulness, that, that it, 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 in it we are necess we are like controlled by laws. We are like laws of physics. It is a sphere of necessity, right? Necessity. So necessity and instrumental rationality, where we work like with through commodities, treat everything as a means to an end, um, is together with Kant in the first critique. Okay, the second critique is pure morality of the, of the categorical imperative. Now the third one is judgment. It's aesthetic on one hand, right? But it also bridges the first two. So this, it, it deals with, in a sense, the stuff that is, but also what ought to be. So, you know, the second critique is pure morality, but nobody ever knows what it is, because it's this categorical imperative, you know, do act as if act according to which you act, could be generalized as through your will without contradiction, and nobody can say what that is. You know, he couldn't even say what it was. He couldn't give an example. Right? Um, and, and, but this one, where, where, where judgment comes in, you've got to have empirical stuff. You know, you've got to be dealing in the context of, of actual affairs or events or laws or something like that. Now the thing about, um, and I'll finish here, uh, the thing about judgment is, is well, we, yeah, we talked about this already, yeah, judgment. And maybe, you know, maybe the humanities are partly about this third critique stuff, the arts, but not always, you know. Because I, th I, I, I understand them in kind of a more critical, this in a more critical way, in the, in the context of critique, of critique. Um, yeah, we've seen this stuff already. Um, Okay, um, okay, now if um, first critique is about means to an end, and second critique is pure ends, the third critique you guys know me, I always talk about pure means. Pure means. It's means without ends. It's what Kat calls Zweckmäßigkeit ohne Zweck, Zweck, which means finality without end. It's in which there's no external end, yeah? A work of art is right, is understood, or, or anything, without regard to any external end, whether that external end is the good or a commodity or something like that. So I think what, what, what's going on here in terms of justice for Kant, uh, which bridges this gap between the pure end, right, of, of, of pure morality and, and this kind of concrete stuff that's going on in everyday life, is is something like means without ends. Now, that is interesting, I think, because, for Hong Kong thieves, because uh, means without ends, I think, is anarchism. We jump from G stuff, and I think it's also, the stuff largely at stake is stuff like Occupy, you know, in Hong Kong. Um, in that, um, in that, in that, and I think that, you know, if Walter Benjamin, for Benjamin, justice is means without ends, and he argues against, very similar as I was just doing, you know. <clears throat> and, 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 and this is an anarchist text for Benjamin. He reads Sorel, Reflections on Violence. Yeah, and he, and he argues this. And, and, and it's, um, and, and Occupy, and, and um, the interesting thing about me is, that it is, is in a sense, Occupy and, and comes out of, you know, of course, of the, you know, the continuation from the Arab Spring to the Indignados in, in Spain and then, um, and then occupies you know, the states and everywhere in the near, you know, um, which, which is based on kind of largely an anarchist sensibility. And, you know, probably if there's a main writer, it's just David Graeber from Gold, was a goldsmith, but he, he left because he could make more money when he left. Um, but never mind. Uh, good guy. Um, and, and again, means with audience, um, and where, where there's not a dictatorship with a proletariat, and in which 
you know, the movement hasn't got, the movement largely does not state demands. It comes out of the occupation and emerges like that. So, and I think also potentiality is at the heart of all of this. So, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that, um, the, you know, it, it is the, you know, again, what is the responsibility of the university? Or how does the university perceive justice? Or how can the faculties connect to things like these kinds of notions of justice? And I've tried to relate it to that through a bunch of arguments to um, this possible kind of politics, which is about potentiality. So I think at that point, I'll hand over to somebody who knows much more about all of this than me, which is uh, my, one of my heroes, Leo B. Wish you could talk more. <laughs> Am I supposed to come in? Uh, yeah. I'll criticize. Or just say something. Well, I'll say something. Uh, I thought the topic today is uh, the dialogue between the social sciences and the humanity. And I've, I've learned so yes, much from it. it. In a way, it is. But then, of course, uh, Scott has added a, a, a sort of, if it is a kind of triangle, there's a third point. And forward, on top of both, that's the university. You're really raising the question of the ideal of the university. And that, of course, we we are you know, both the beneficiaries and the victims. Uh, a lot of people commented on, on the state of the university today, uh, ranging from uh, you know 30, 40 years ago, Tarkor Parsons, who the sociologist, you know, whom nobody reads now, uh, who once I audited his class actually, oh my God. and I just couldn't stand it because he considered. <laughs> He considered the university to be the ideal place you know, you know, for a rational society. But the microcosm of a person was the, the university. Mm -hmm. uh, unless, of course, he believes that uh, the university rests on all those grand ideals of Europe. Uh, of course, Scott has given us this very zigzag view of the various conflicts, all the nuances. Uh, you, you didn't mention Derrida's uh, you know, that, that lecture. I remember once I attended a lecture uh, in the early 80s at Berkeley when the editor asked to comment on the state of the university of the California system. I remember what the editor said was, uh, I have no solution to your financial crisis. If I were to create a new university, there should be only one department, and that is the Department of Philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> or you can turn all departments into departments of philosophy. I mean, you know, he, he said that tongue-in-cheek, but basically I think his, his way of putting it, that philosophy is the source of all. You know, you will get, you can, you know, all the, the you know, law, you know, theology, when you really come down to the Brazilian university, it really is the philosophy. At the University of Chicago, where you went to school, right? No, no, I went to high school there. But you went to high school there? I went to their high school. I, I taught there for eight years. Religion was still, when I was there, very strong, but it's called yeah, theology, it's called divinity, divinity, yeah. yeah, divinity was very strong, medical school. Uh, philosophy compared to these two was relatively weak. Yeah. So, so you might say, to some extent, the American universities, or maybe I don't know about the English universities, uh, are to some extent uh, both reflectors and the critics of the Brian tradition. So basically, I think it's very useful for us to reflect upon the present state of the university in Hong Kong. I don't know how many times I have attacked the university system. Really? To no avail whatsoever. Really? Really? <laughs> Let me do it again. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think if one could apply, you know, realistically, the university structure to Scott's system, basically it's a practical way of doing means without an end. If there were an end, that end was called, quote, output. <laughs> you are all input. Then somehow we process the whole thing through some kind of practical instrumental rationality, meaning figures and money. Mm -hmm. uh, we come out with an output. But nobody defines what output is. Uh, we are all asked to put in our syllabus the output of this court. Okay. Uh, what is the expected output, expected outcome, not output, outcome 
of this court. I, I think we teachers are all done. And I refuse to do it. I said there's no outcome in my court. Yeah. Uh, but but since I, I'm not under threat of tenure, that's why. I, <laughs> otherwise, everybody would fight. Yeah. So I had a feeling that the grand ideals have been twisted in, in, in a kind of social practice, uh, which is backed up by many. So in, in a way, we are really talking about the restoration of a certain critical ideal, or to restore ideals, and then look at those ideals in a critical way, so that we can release some of the potential. This is basically what we humanists are doing. I'm sure Scott is half humanist and half social science. You really bridge all the fields, you know, from media, to sociology, you know, to cultural studies, to everything else. Now he's speaking uh, Chinese. Later on, you can ask him in Chinese. <laughs> yeah. So, so I will be very eager to to sort of discuss some of these implications uh, between the high ideal, either east or west, on the one hand, and the practical realities on the other. But some more in a kind of a rational way, you know, not in the nitty gritty stuff, right? Yeah. So if I could rephrase the whole argument a little bit and, and put it in our own words. See, uh, uh, my feeling is that now there exist uh, two ways of defining the university, whether it was the social science and humanism or that. Yeah. One way is the kind of a, a revised version of the Western humanistic tradition from 18th century from Khan all the way to the present. To that, I might add the comparable Chinese tradition. Uh, but let me draw on that first one first before I attack the second one. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the counterpart in a Chinese case, uh, what was the comparable Chinese university around, uh, say, the 18th century or earlier? The answer was a small colleges, uh, the academies run by new Confucians in the countryside. It's like a prep school, but advanced prep school. Zhu Xi taught at Bai Lu Dong, right? or Yami or Zhu Xi, you know, I can't remember. But, but basically, it was the, the, the uh, realization of the Confucius ideal, namely the teacher would live with the students and uh, teach the students in a, a kind of daily form. So it's kind of living together. You know, translating into American system will be smaller schools, uh, Andover and, and maybe more Amherst, but a small school. I just watched a movie called Dead Poets Society. Have you seen that? Dead Poets Society. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, see. I mean, that's a kind of a cult movie, right? You know, it's like a small place, very rich, but then suddenly you have this, 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 uh, this page of teacher who gets everybody to think. So I mean, basically, we we we, we, we hear echo between East and West. You know? Basically, we're all trying to release the potentialities of the human being. Uh, uh, of course, in different ways, you know, from from each other. But then the Western idea, the whole package of the Western university idea, you know, the German model, the yeah. Italian model, and the, especially the American model, was introduced into China in the 1930s. Mm. The Western model was gradually introduced into China in the 1930s. Yeah. Especially the departmental structure, as far as I know. Uh, in China, before, there were no departments. You may say division. There are no divisions, actually. So in Zhuxi school, everybody studied Confucian text. You may have different. Uh, in the 18th century, I didn't know. There may have been some uh, gatherings of scholars, you know, basically following the a new country introduction. But in the 1930s, the missionaries introduced, the missionary educators from America in particular, introduced the departments, psychology, sociology, anthropology, uh, I don't know when economics. So this is how the university in the Western style was organized. And then following that curriculum, textbooks, uh, the Harvard English textbooks were introduced also in the 1930s in the first, the EY in, in, in Beijing now. Uh, now it's called the, the Foreign University of Beijing, something like that. Yeah. 
Oh, 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 Beijing Wei Gui Lao Xue. That's right, Beijing Wei Gui Lao Xue. So that the whole package was introduced to China, together with the leftover from the traditional curriculum. So you have this combination. <coughs> Even that idea is lost. Uh, let me say, now come back to the 21st century of Hong Kong. Okay? What remains of that idea? Because some of the best universities in China in the 1930s were missionary universities. Tsinghua in particular. Yanjing was another. Beijing University, of course, uh, inherited the grand old tradition, but even Beijing University also introduced the uh, And then some other universities such as Nankai and you know, Fudan and all that. So these universities, the ideals such as the, the, shall we say, the Republican ideal, namely the ideals of the university in the Republican era, basically were totally refurbished, disbanded and reorganized in the 1950s in China with the Soviet model. That is to say that you repackage, reorganize university structure, combining several universities into different huge universities. But more specifically, they abolished some of the Western-oriented departments, in particular philosophy. There was only study of Marxism, but no philosophy, no sociology, because these were supposed to be Western bourgeois departments. Now, in the 80s, after that, Chinese universities were trying to revive both the 1930s tradition and the American so they're still doing it. Because now as you can see also the conflict is doing it. Yeah. Meanwhile, we have a new sort of input. This is what I call the, the ideal number two, or the structure number two. Uh, this is the corporate university following the capitalist model. The, the global capitalism. Oh, of course. Corporation. Yeah. The corporate model, for me, originated from Clark Kerr. The, uh, what's it called, kind of multi-university or something like that? Berkeley in the 60s. Sure. Uh, that was not purchased by, by capitalist money. That was because there were so many uh, veterans from war, because they, you have to, you know, people have to come to, they have the right to attend university. So Carla Kerr has the idea that the university should serve society and become a microcosm of society. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we should include both the humanity and social science, all the traditional government structure, and also some aspects of vocational training. But that, of course, that idea, of course, was later on you know, branched off in all kinds of things in the American system. So here we finally come to the offshoot of this sort of modern number two in Hong Kong. This is where the corporate idea basically was put into the center of the structure. I'm trying to, I hope somebody can do research on this. Where did the corporate idea come into the universal structure? You know, the mechanism of that, of that, that structure. I have a friend who teaches uh, in the civil engineering department, the computer engineering department. But finally he decided to give up. He said it's just too much. He doesn't want to follow the model. So he becomes a regular teacher. Uh, Will Ng, he's a Cambridge educated professor. Yeah. So he's the one who gave me all this information. He said the corporate model was introduced by, uh, I can't know, two German scholars, or I can't remember, but two European scholars you know, who basically wanted to uh, uh, make a typical corporation, a typical company, work more efficiently, to make more money with less manpower, with less time. Uh, you know, kind of revision of Taylorism. Uh, so, so this is how that structure was, was basically originally intended for the corporation, commercial corporation. But lo and behold, uh, a couple of Australian educators were invited by the UGC. I have to check all the data, uh, by the UGC, right, to introduce this model uh, to improve the efficiency of the university structure. Right. Now we are all the beneficiaries, or if you like it, victims of this particular structure. That is an input-output uh, sort of assembly line work. Uh, 
uh, efficiency, uh, rationality, you know, you, know, you, you do all that. Right? So, uh, what is the goal of the university structure? So now looking from the Hong Kong angle, back to Scott's very idealized picture, I wish I could take all of them. I would take Derrida, Kant, all the great philosophers of the past, you know, all the traditions of German law, or French law, or whatever, and reintroduce all of them to our students. <laughs> Together as Confucianists or whatever. Yeah. But these things are supposed to be, I hate to say this, to the bureaucrats that control the money, irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Basically, that considers to be relevant. What is relevant is, is if you invent something, and that makes a lot of money for the university or for Hong Kong, that's good. Uh, if you, you basically, it's, it's, it's sort of utter utilitarianism. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So the university, in a way, is the, the think tank, the training ground for the future expansion of this kind of an organized society of the state. What is the end of that society? Yeah. What is the original sort of idea of that society? I really don't know. Nobody has subtitled. There's one word that is toyed, that is used by all the administrators. Every single university in Hong Kong uses the word. The word is excellence. How do you judge excellence? Ranking. Who who controls the ranking? They never ask that question. Who are the powers who control, who design the ranking chart? A couple of British newspapers. They use the British system. They do not want to use the American system. I don't know why. But what has that, what has that got to do with Derrida and Kant? Because Kant, after all, is arguing about the common ground of human reason, whether you like it or not. Uh, he's trying to release human potentiality. So he agrees to serve the king only on that basis. Otherwise, and he wants to attack, as Scott said, attack the kind of religion without you know, a kind of rational ground. And of course, Daddy Dai, in his very elaborate kind of deconstructive way, is basically trying to restore, in my view, some kind of human justice on a broad level. That's why in his last years he was working on justice. In fact, he gave a talk on that topic right at this university. Really? Yeah, in 2001. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't come, but he, that was his, you know, after his tour in China, he came to this university yeah, and, and talked about justice. You know, type of, type of so, so in a way, I think the Western philosophers are really coming back to uh, whether their disagreement whatever their tradition, coming back to a sense of the kind of Western tradition in crisis, and they are trying to do something about it. Uh, whereas uh, I'm the only one here who uses the word crisis. They don't like the word crisis. I said, let's put it in a more positive sense, right? Crisis gives us solutions. Crisis makes us think, right? In Chinese, Wei Qi, right? You know Wei and Chi Wei, right? Yeah, bro, it's like, yeah. I remember I raised this issue. I raised this issue when I served as a member of the RGC. RGC oh. means the Research Council, Research Brand Council. Originally, was a very good thing. It's to help all colleagues and students to get, get money. So I said, if the humanities, the Hong Kong education was in crisis, let's all try to think about how to really help our students. Or, uh, nobody listened. So finally, of course, they thought I was just talking nonsense. So finally, luckily, I was invited back to Chinese University to teach. Uh, so that's why I feel that it is my duty to continue this voice of dissent uh, in a constructive way, uh, so as to help us think through some of these issues raised by Scott and many others. That's why I'm here. So I basically, I welcome every opportunity to, to, to come to a forum like this. Uh, maybe Anthony should ask something. If I'm going too far, Anthony can correct me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, um, after hearing both um, your things, um, and as an administrator of the university, <laughs> and I feel really 
like feeling the crisis and your management. Um, um, talking about the faculty that you are talking about, I, I guess nowadays um, those lower fac so called the lower faculties defined by Kantian Kantian solution um, is actually dominating. Like I say, like like whatever departments having an end and more an instrumental ends. Mm -hmm. um, Producing uh, more output states, more graduates earning more money, um, then they are getting more popular. I, I but then this is um, not about just our university. The crisis is not about university; it's about the entire society. Um, so it's not also about choice. Like like our, nowadays, like um, our students are making choice, and and they're making choices based on a common like thinking that like like maybe. Uh, like business, uh, marketing, finance, uh, these are kind of like corporate companies for, and then they are they are they are more more like um, sustainable um, and and more like more accepted in, in this kind of like capitalist world. Um, so so in the end, like the university also subs also like subscribe to this idea. So in the end, like theology. Um, uh, philosophy, even cultural studies, or music, even uh, are, 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 are originally a more higher faculty in in in, in discussing, reduced to a very minimal thing in in the department in in the university. Um, I I guess in, uh, we like I I I see somebody like in journalism communication in 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 other universities as well. I I guess we are a little bit in the middle, um, uh, because we, first of all, uh, we could produce jobs. But at the same time, um, I guess, the, uh, as I said, all, always in, in the old, educa old journalism education, uh, people were like, teaching things like learning skills, learning um, facts, facts as you, you mentioned. Uh, that is how to get effects, and this kind of like are uh, not not higher, the higher faculty. Um, in, in fact, like, like we are, I said in, we are in the middle because we actually we are still talking about some some higher goals like like freedom, um, social responsibility, um, um, uh, good values, uh, humanities, um, but this have not been highlighted. I guess in in the history of journalism education, ever. Um, I guess nowadays we, as we have like the, the movement, occupy movement, we still we, we are actually talking more about that. So what what do we really want? Do we really want to have a a, a very a kind of like vocational training school training students um, just for the work, um, getting facts more and a little bit. Analytical things, but not, not in in a higher sense, a higher philosophical sense. Um, I I don't know. I, I don't know how how to uh, like answer your your questions. I, I guess the crisis still still here, although the new generation might realize it. Uh, uh, our educators don't know how to face it and and come up with a newer solution. Maybe how do you think the English universities are doing? You have been there for many years. I mean, I think, I, I think, think in, terms of, in terms of Hong Kong, you're, I think you're wrong. Um, no, no, because, and, and, and you're wrong, I mean, because it's the English model that's, that's won here. Not, and, and the British model, although, <clears throat> although we, we had a, well, the, the British model is, is Thatcher, Mrs. Thatcher. And from, from about 1979, 80, um, the research, the RAE, all that stuff is from, that's from, from Britain. And they went to Australia as well as here and went to too many countries. In fact, the US has been lucky because they've escaped some of it. Um, and and you're, you're, you've been very lucky, Leo, because um, you were at Chicago, which was a great place. And you know the whole Robert Maynard Hutchins philosophy. Right. And um, some of the others, you know, some of it which is a funny misguided tomism, but it worked and <laughs> opened up a space of, 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 of thought, which was quite, a, and still is there. 
which is quite amazing. Whereas the British one really bureaucratized and really the input, output, you guys are, you know, and China's getting almost as bad as Hong Kong, you know, with the, um, you know, the, the different kind of rankings of the journals that you have to publish. I mean, you have to do here. And in China, you know, even worse than elsewhere. And, and then, so, so there's been this kind of full circle. And, and the funny thing is then, the research university, as you know, starts in Germany. And you have the humanist university in Oxford, Cambridge, um, the Sorbonne. Research university starts in Germany, Africa. That's about 1840, 50. That model spreads to the US, although it doesn't completely decimate it. Um, and the very funny thing is the university rankings, which of course the Times Higher Ed is the big one, it starts in China. There's a Shanghai ranking. And the reason that, and then the, the, the Times Higher Ed monopolizes and takes it over, but there's still about two or three big China rankings. Not here, but China, China. And um, the weird thing is now the, the biggest expenditure on research in the world now is Germany. They've created all these excellence clusters. Again, this excellence word coming from the UK. Um, and, 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 but the Germany's created excellence clusters of 50 and 60 million euro bits of money because Germany thought they were getting behind in the international rankings, which were set by China. <laughs> so, so it gets worse and worse. Who started I mean, all this? Well, I, I, Germany started it, now they finished it, I guess. Oh, but, but my kind of feeling about all this is, is that you made me think that my career, if you want to call it a career, you know, what I've really been associated with is things like Theory, Culture, and Society, the journal. You know, for 25 or 28 years, 30. And now Goldsmiths for 16 years. Both of them, which are really extra university things. Theory, Culture, and Society, which is the most cited cultural studies journal in the world, blah, 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 loaded, started not at Oxford and Cambridge, but the north of England. People who were excluded from the main system. Mike Featherstone, Ryan Turner, all these people, Owen Robertson, all the kind of people from outside. And Mike has been running it. And it's, it, it's extra university largely. And Goldsmiths, where I've come to, you know, works on projects with artists, with media, with all sorts of things. And, it's all, and you do a lot of public stuff now, Leo, with music and everything. And I've always seen Leo Lee as a public intellectual in a lot of ways, you know, although you've been a university one. And I wonder if maybe the way to go is to move partly outside of the university. You know, one reason I think I'm talking to Daisy about this, that you know, like in Hong Kong, there's a lot. Of, I think there's a lot of potential in South China. You know, uh, for working with the arts, for working with you know design, for working with music, for working in, in, in public space, and maybe the best way to avoid a lot of this is to partly move out of the university and move and, and move into different kind of different kinds of action. Yeah, but I want to say one point about the American system. It's not, not really escaping from the bureaucracy, but it's not, well, it's escaping from bureaucracy, but it's not escaping from, I call it like academic capitalism. People, like people who got more grants and will be more like rewarding and getting bigger salary, whatever. So it's not, it's equally like, like, like supporting the bison thing. Um, one. Yeah, maybe we can open up and uh, for yeah, want to say something. Hi. Oh, you know. You're sure you all have a lot to say. Speak, speak, Mandarin or Cantonese? Yeah, yeah. We did just have a good song. Want to say something? Hi, uh, Lizzie. <laughs> I think you can do something. I don't know. Ah, this works. Um, I guess um, perhaps like many many of us sitting in the audience, um, we share the feeling, we share the frustration. Um, <laughs> and we also wonder what can we do in order to release a, at least not to that extent, but at least to expand that um, uh, that 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 area of being able to 
because we, I, I guess personally, I feel that we are always strategizing and using little tactics to trick the system so that we could increase that space for potentialities. How do we frame and frame, especially in terms of language, which so much of this is geared towards the scientific outcome-based impact assessment, um, which is completely instrumental, completely um, means to an end, completely end-driven, rather. Uh, there's almost no, no space for means. Um, what kind of struck me was the idea of moving, I mean, Devi Dai talks about moving the university outside, uh, sorry, moving um, knowledge and learning outside of the university. And I, I'm not sure, but if I remember correctly, I think he actually runs something like that. I think he wrote a book called Eyes of the University and he runs something like this in Paris where he does these public seminars and probably people pay to go and listen. So more, more like that kind of uh, system that, that uh, Scott described at the beginning. Um, and I wonder what is that sort of, um, how, could we, how could we imagine a space like this that we can reach out, especially in terms of humanities and social sciences, where on the one hand we are eager to transfer com comes to mind, but it's not a good word because that's also been bureaucratized in knowledge transfer or knowledge exchange, uh, whatever you know it's called nowadays. Uh, but in a way which relates to the public. Um, so that's sort of one, one idea I had. And the other one, um, which is coming back to me now, is also thinking about this idea of critical thinking, which is, for me, seems like the sh only shield that the humanities and social sciences have in terms of selling or, 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 or telling our students that this is an important skill. But yet, somehow, I feel that this critical thinking perhaps leads to something like Occupy. And then what happens after? If, if philosophy, the love of wisdom, leads to understanding of morality or ethics in that Kantian sense, and, and, and judgment, how could we, and, and at this point, as educators, as people reaching to students, or people reach, or as, uh, you know, very, um, in academia, reaching out to the public, how could we use this as to, to reach further? Um, I guess. Sorry. Any, any, any other? Um, yeah, any, any more questions? I have a lot of questions to ask God because you know you, you have all the experience, uh, but but I have some speculation. Because uh, you know, looking from this shore, of course, the other side may be greener. Uh, because I first met you uh, years ago, I think, uh, in the states, or uh, Chicago. Oh, Shanghai. 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 Yeah, Washington. You know, the very fact that we could meet means that the sun channels are open. Because otherwise, you know, I was supposed to be in Chinese studies then. Sociology. You're in sociology, right? Yeah. Uh, aside from our friends Wang Xiaoming's energy you know, as a, to serve as a bridge, you know, he was the one who get all of us together. You know. I think there was uh, at least one. I was, I was, I may have been very lucky to have, have been given the opportunity to teach at some refiner university such as Chicago, which was my idea. Uh, uh, Chicago, I remember that uh, for all its problems. Uh, something was floating in the air, and that was cross-disciplinary yeah. spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, every opportunity was made, uh, conferences, symposiums, whatnot, you know, so that people could talk to each other. Yeah. Uh, people can, I learned a lot from, from that. Yeah. I think the further bu bureaucratization here is that uh, I, every colleague here is driven to the limit, so busy, everybody's so busy. There simply is no time to do anything. Uh, when we first met, we still had time, but you have the energy. You have the energy, and you know, we could somehow find time. That is to say, some kind of a space must be on, on, on the professional level, too. You know, we, we talk about common core education, general education to train our students. 
Yeah, that's has to be done. I think people, you know, our colleagues is doing very well here. It's how to carry out uh, intellectual exchange across disciplines. Uh, here, I think, you know, people in England and America are doing much better than in Hong Kong. We don't talk to each other. You know, because of you, I met Anthony. You know, now I'm trying to collaborate with you. Yeah. Right? See, we're in the same university, right? You know, you know, he's up here, I'm down here. The two shall never meet. This is bizarre. This is really bizarre. You know, it happens only in Hong Kong, somehow. Yeah, Chicago is unthinkable. Everybody is walking into that one big building, social sciences building, mm -hmm. and you just, you know, you know I, you know, Edward Shields was loafing around. You know, this tall guy there. And then on the other hand, there was, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, so everybody is Mister or Mrs. or Miss. You know, nobody is called professor. Yeah. So, so that's why Shields was able to talk about this ideal community. And he said, you're going to Chicago. Uh, and we all have our own sense of ideal communities. Is it possible to create, in a smaller scale, our own ideal community on several levels? One would be uh, across the professional discipline. This is what I'm trying to do. I recently opened up, uh, in a verse, in my own way, a I now teach one seminar called R6000, uh, which I call connection or reconnection. The purpose of which is to talk only about broad concepts, but across disciplines. Every year I invite up to 10 or 12 guest lecturers. So if I talk for about four or five weeks, and then the rest is for, for everyone. I just got pointed colleagues so far. So finally, it has become a way of getting to talk to each other. Uh, uh, and I guess, as far as I know, this is the only course. If other colleagues can do that, yeah. they will be held accountable. That is to say, how come you invite so many people? You're supposed to teach all your course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot invite all that. I'm the exception. Uh, so I think there should be more exceptions. Or more sort of a upper level free intellectual exchanges. I don't know how completely it can be done. This is basically inspired by the models I have learned from England and America and all that, you know, all those countries gradually become into smaller groups. Remember there's a group I joined, you, you may have heard of Benjamin Lee's group, Transcultural Studies, I never met you in there. Chicago. In Chicago, right, right. And I learned so much from that group. Basically it's a group of scholars from different fields. We gathered together four times a year, and for one, for each time we had one weekend. Basically, people just talk. People talk and talk about text and all that. There's no formal conference structure, uh, but we learn so much from each other, and all of that, some ideas were created. Uh, if I gave, if I proposed the same idea here, people thought I'm crazy. You have no agenda. What? You just talk. You have no agenda. Uh, so here, people need. In a way, there's too much end, you know, practical end. Yeah. Too much practical end. Efficient mean. So I like to restore some kind of an ends in the true Kantian sense. Uh, maybe Kant is very relevant to us. I'm glad you're talking about it. Maybe we should talk to the bureaucrat. Let him force them to read Kant. It's interesting. You, it must have been. At your time, and Chicago is quite an amazing place. I, I know to went to high school, and my, my mom actually was Edward Chilton's student. Oh. Yeah, um, and um, the, um, yeah, and, and um, one thing I, I remember when I was a graduate student at, uh, at the London School of Economics in uh, London, Gigi Shwisha, and um, I remember going to Chicago, back to Chicago then, and every first year student would read Aristotle, and would read, I think, E.P. Thompson's Making of the English Working Class. And some would read maybe part of Max Weber. Right. I think Weber was replaced by E.P. Thompson. But one you know, kind of social, and one classic, Aristotle, Aristotle whether it was a Nicomachean ethics, or whatever. Um, and um, it was quite amazing. Even if you were in the sciences, you, know, you read that. So that there was this community of, of, of and it was quite extraordinary. It just, so hard to imagine that happening today, but God, it would be a great idea if, if it did. Um, I mean, what strikes me is, um, 
the, not, not, the both times we met, we didn't, we didn't meet inside of a university structure. That's right, that's right. That's <clears> it. It's I mean, Wang Shaoming's conference was in the Shanghai Public Library. Right. And you, and, and Wang Shaoming knew you um, for a long time, and you knew his dad, and um, the person that both of us knew in common, you and I knew in common, was Rem Kulas, the Harvard Dakucha architect. You know, from Beijing, CCTV. We, we met in Hong Kong, you know. You know Later about the same thing, Kong, exactly. Kong, right? So I was brought over to, right. I was brought over to China, you know, today by Ram, right. 2003, to do some work on a conceptual master plan for the, uh, for the Shiba Way, for the Shanghai uh, Expo. Right. Uh, and then later on the West Kowloon Culture District. You know, neither of which were academic. And, and, and you, had, you, were, you, you were the most open person I could ever imagine. You know, you were, there were no prejudices. I just couldn't believe this guy, Leo Li, uh, Leo Fan. And then the second time we met, as you said, was in the um, Shanghai, the Shanghai, uh, Hong Kong, Shenzhen Architecture Biennale. That's right, that's the last And it was 2007, I think. And it was, it was the old police station on a panel. And it was such a beautiful space that when I, uh, Came back to Hong Kong. I insisted to be at Hollywood Road because I didn't even know where it was. Right. But you know, but then what's happened in that space now? This this Australian guy's taking it over, and 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 turning it into a commercial district that's meant to have some culture in it, but totally commercially driven. So this wonderful open space that was just magnificent to look at the shows and they have this open discussion, which was outside of the university and connecting to architecture and the art and urban space. And even, even, even you know, a little bit later, uh, Hong Kong, um, you know, pre-occupy um, public artists like Lu Ching, you know, who captures, who, who, who captures public, hijacks public space and uses it. This beautiful space then turns into this bloody horrible commercial accumulation of capital thing that's going on now. So whenever something wonderful happens, Horrible happens. Um, anyway, that was the, the, uh, the beginnings. There are. Um, any, any, any more? Any more comments? comments? Any more comments? Any more comments? Or or the, or the size? I I got one more little thing about about. I mean, sorry, I, mean, I talk too much, obviously, like usual. Uh, it, it's interesting when you talk about the Chinese university, the mainland Chinese university. Um, the, the, and we're talking about Prussia and all that, you know, Germany. Um, the United States Parliament, it's a nation of lawyers. You know, about 60 or 70 percent or 80 percent of the U.S. Senate and House is lawyers. Yeah. The Chinese, Chang Weiwei, and the Politburo is engineers. You know, and Tsinghua and all those places produced engineers. And if you're not an engineer, forget it. And then you know China becomes the infrastructure society, you know, for, you know, civil engineering, and even right now the new kind of uh, Xi Jinping, uh, kind of you know new bank, new world bank, is based on infrastructure, and and, and, and Chinese international better than it's based on inter infrastructure than it's ba than being based on drones, you know, which is, which is very foreign policy, but 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 I think it's really interesting how these, you know, how engineering come up, came up. And the other two areas that are, you know, are neither science nor neither human science. I think I think I think I'm agreeing with Leo and and, and, and with um, with Daisy um, because in, 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 in a lot of places the the science and then the human and then the human social science model destroys this humanities model through um, outputs and inputs and impact and citations and all this stuff. And now it's even taken over our humanities research council in the UK, trying to use the same measures, you know, that the sciences, social science got from the sciences. Um, so it seems to be dominating. But but I think again this this other this other thing about engineering and computer science, which aren't really sciences or arts, they're applied. applied. And, 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 and what's media studies? Media studies is something that's massive. I mean, journalism was a little thing that started. 
And then it became this huge media studies thing that's everywhere in the world, right? Okay. Um, and you were one of the first ones here. Um, but but it, it's something that's in between, and at the same time connected to practice, which I think in some ways is a very good thing. You know, because the world of, world of theory connects with the world of, can connect with the world of practice. Yes, it can become a very bad thing, no question. But, but I think that, um, I mean, that's when I, when I came to Goldsmiths, and everything was about art practice, and then also about media practice and, and design. Um, moving out into different kind of spaces, I thought it was a wonderful thing, partly. So I think that maybe, again, trying to think of what can happen outside of the university. You know, Occupy is something, yes, the university played an important role, but it happened outside here, you know. And, 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 and I'm thinking that maybe, um, you know, there's, there's a possibility for the creation of all sorts of spaces. And then finally, the, um, you know, not, not a lot of stuff is, is digitized, right? And maybe the humanities and social sciences, in, in certain ways and in, in bad ways, are put together. But maybe in good ways, may, maybe some of this digital stuff goes beyond in maybe a positive way. And um, and, and also, um, you know, the last, when you said Derry does last stuff about justice, um, he's also talking about non-human and and the environment. And maybe that kind of potential is, is hugely, hugely important for us. And, and not just human, human I, I guess to respond to, I, I guess we, the applied subjects, like, like journalism or media, we were outside, actually. Yeah, we, uh, like, like, like in colonial days, it, doesn't, it didn't exist in Hong Kong U, because it's not the mainstream, so with only here. Harvard still has it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Harvard, St well, Stanford now has it, um, but not in Princeton, not in Yale. Um, like, um, like cultural studies, also they are always the marginal. Uh, but, but, but quite, quite contradictory. Like, like nowadays, we people uh, like having this kind of dialogue. Uh, actually, not in sociology, huh. not in political science, not in major departments, and only in these marginal spaces. Uh, yeah. Um, Are you humanities or social science? We, or neither? Yeah, we 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 some, we are always regarded as the kind of like real things in in social science. Um, but yeah. but in some in some universities, you guys come out of humanities. Yeah, right, right. So, <laughs> so I, I guess we 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 have to make use of this kind of marginal space to to do something. You know that reminds me. Once you gave a talk here, uh, at the and the invitation to cultural studies to Harvard. Remember that? You, you at the end, you gave a list of of uh, great European thinkers. As you remember, uh, you talk about both you went to you know. Uh, I, I have a very distinct impression of it. I thought, well, none of those can be rigidly categorized as a sociologist or you know some you know as David David Harvey yeah. geographer, yeah. Uh, Bruno Latour is you know from some engineering. Around, you know, and you talk about this Dutch guy, Slaughter Yap or something. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, right. right. You talk about you know, his idea of space, but, you know. And I think that's, to me, it's a great trend. That is to say that people from different areas are confronting a same range of problems, such as an environment, you know, ethic, or both human ethics, or you don't call it back. Right? Yeah. I think in Europe, people have a, such awareness. Please, whether you know, whether it's, whether you practice it, that's another, another issue. Uh, uh, this is what, and recently, I went as a tourist to Barcelona. Oh, yeah. Would you believe that in a bookstore there, all the philosophers you mentioned were there, in Spanish and Catalonian translation. They, they are listening, I was in Fabregasco. But then I realized I didn't read Catalonian and Spanish, I couldn't read them. And then I would, I would go to any bookstore in Hong Kong, I couldn't find a single book by, by people. You know, I have to order, I have to mail order. Except for maybe the Kubrick. Kubrick has movie book. Oh no, it's got, it's got I, when I went to the Kubrick, I was teaching Hannah Arendt, I remember one time, and there were seven, eight books by Hannah Arendt from Chicago. By Hannah Arendt, yeah, by Hannah Arendt. Yeah. It's so happy I have to have. Then I bought Eisenstein's diary, I bought Eisenstein's collected article, wow. volume two. Only one was bought by someone else. Occasionally, you might you get something like that. 
Like you have you have to sort of look at that's Hong Kong's attraction. Actually. All this book on here and there, you find something. You know, I mean, it's it's really wonderful occasionally. So there are people in Hong Kong who really are keen on some of these ideas. It's just that we have to release these people. We have to get them out. This is what I find Hong Kong most exciting and frustrating. It's the bureaucrat that stifle all of us, not the people. Maybe people can talk about media and journalism because we have the audience here. Yeah, you know, we're yeah. talking yeah. about our yeah. 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 What about creative media, right? I mean, yeah, we have. Any people. potentiality? I'm sure it's great potentiality. Yeah, yeah. So quiet. I guess. Uh, I guess part of the yeah, reason, yeah, reason why many of us are, are quite is that I, I think for many junior academics, I'm a junior academic that uh, come back for three years, and I feel that I feel that I think um, is it Daisy was talking about sort of that frustration of what mm -hmm. can we do mm -hmm. under such a system because you either you either follow the norm or you won't be able to survive, and there's only yeah. so much. Extracurricular activity that yeah. we can. So much time you have. Right? Take on, and there's only yeah. there's so only so limited energy. So right. so I guess sort of I, I was just in in in, in Sussex. Actually, I just fly back last night, and then and then and then I and then and then what I also heard from the key speaker, Professor Ken Pong, who I sure. admire a lot, is also that. He also thinks that he won't be able to survive the tenure system. And every, every, almost every emeritus professor that I hear from nowadays is saying that they, they, they think that they won't be able to survive the system, and they're not sure whether they're going to uh, encourage PhD students to to further. And, and so, so I guess, I guess my question, and I guess maybe shared by some of the audience, is what what can we do? Because it's either you follow. The system, or or, uh, or not, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, there's so there seems so little way that as junior academics, that how how do we not even I guess in in some situations not even thinking about potentialities, but thinking about sort of just just making the daily means. <laughs> so I guess that how how can we get out of that frustration and and still. And still energize the students and ourselves, as it were. Yeah. Anthony has a great solution, I'm sure. Uh, not, not, not really. Uh, <laughs> 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 things have gotten worse. I mean, it, it's things have got worse. They've, they've, uh, you know, in Britain, Br Britain, you know, totally hierarchized their system. You know it now, where, you know, where everybody's in a short-term contract yeah. till, you know, for the first six years of their career. And then finally they might get a long, longer-term contract and then they're tied in, I mean, especially in, in the UK and Hong Kong um, and, and now China, where I think the States is actually a little bit better, uh, where you know, they're tied into the, this many publications and this impact and this, this level of, this, of the social science, the SSIA, is it, or something like that? So SSI, 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 and it's it's no, it's a nightmare. I mean, and um, it wasn't like that even 12 years ago, um, because you went right in with a permanent job in the UK, and they didn't short term. They saved money by putting people on short term contracts, and they get to pay some other people more money. So um, it's really hard to know what the solution is. I don't know that there's less intellectual life in general, though, than there used to be. It's just not in university. It's happening in places like the Kubrick, where they have speakers and the films and the discussions. That's what Hong Kong is great for. Small corners of really. You know, in, in, little, in, little, little, in, little, in little spaces, or where we met at the Biennale, or. Um, so it's, it's um, I think the universities, I think probably got themselves in a mess, and, 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 and stupidly, you know, and didn't need to. I don't, I don't think, I mean, Mrs. Thatcher did, nobody need, needed to, it, we didn't need to do that, it just happened. And you guys are the victims. Um, and I don't really know what, um, <laughs> what, what the younger generation are the victims, and I don't really know what, um, how, you know, what can happen. I do think that there is, 
there is a bit of a movement against it, a little bit. But I mean, the, the recent results in the British elections yeah. are not encouraging at all. Yeah, um, yeah well, I, I cannot tell it tell, tell the way, uh, but I can tell it for my own way. Like, like I, I guess for my, oh, I'm, I'm always regarded as the real, real person in the, in the school. I'm not doing really serious journalism or something like that. I'm doing always like popular culture and creative industry, whatever. And 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 the only way to get out of this system actually is find your own way. Say I have collaborators in Australia, Amsterdam, Korea, California. But I sell them work. I sell them work. Like like in, in, in here, like nobody wants to well I, I guess really few people want to like have dialogue with you every day. They just lock the door and then have high efficiency yeah. on, on the work. But but everybody can actually find your own own friend. Like, like in this kind of like I, I guess in, in this kind of like really fast world with digital technologies, it's easier for you to network, co connect connection, to connect to whatever you want to. So um, until now, I, I I still work with my friends all over the world. But but really, if, if you see my publication. All my co-authors are not 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 the Hong Kong guys. Um, I, so so I, everybody has its own way. Um, that's what I did. Yeah. And I, I did connect to to him. <laughs> yeah, I do I do I do feel that somehow the somehow it's very interesting that the university seems to sort of pull away from me. Yeah, we start in, in, in that sense of they sort of ask you to sort of they ask you to disconnect with it in in, in yeah. In, in an interesting way, that you know, perhaps I've been too honest here as a junior academic. Uh, I studied journalism, so I've been taught to be honest. So, <laughs> so it's six local. Um, do you have any maybe last word, conclusion? Um, to say a few words. I don't know how to conclude. Uh, you. Well, if I conclude, start with can you conclude to finish. <laughs> Um, I mean, I suppose um, well, what, what I've actually done is probably wound up doing half of my stuff outside of the university in the last, for so much of, 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 of my career. I mean, if I'd been in if I, Chicago is a particular, is a, a, is a wonderfully seductive place where they have a school of social thought and all these kind of things. And I, I suppose one thing I would encourage, but it's so hard to do. Is 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 the, is the construction of these kind of things inside CUHA, for example? You know, to put together a couple of people. I mean, I first was invited here by architecture, yeah. you know, and then later by media, and I had a little bit of connection with sociology, I think, um, and um, and and I think that um, you know, if you find the two or three people, you know, for, from architecture, from sociology from philosophy, from media, this department, from a couple of others, maybe critical geographers, whoever else, and, and a few from the outside. I think you can maybe get something going. And I think Chicago actually did that. The, 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 the template was this Committee on Social Thought, which had very funny beginnings, which were actually Thomas, believe it or not. You know, G2 Luda, believe it or not. Nobody knows this now. Um, and, 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 and I think that, um, it, it's got to be around a set of ideas and around, around a certain set of thoughts and topics. And maybe something that also reaches out to other institutions and not just uh, CUHK, you know, four or five other institutions and, and, and getting, getting a collective and a, a meeting group possible, whether, whether you meet here or somewhere else or find a space in Hong Kong, you know, that you can get cheap spaces in. Yeah, maybe Asia Art Archive or something else. The place will give you a space. I think that would be the coolest thing to do. And 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 maybe meet around. I think it, it, sometimes it's hard to make it just discussion, but it should be discussion. But but maybe at the same time initiatives. You know, because people love working on something together. That okay, this is a this is a an initiative. This is we're gonna we're gonna go to somebody and get 
a, a space and a, and a project set up. So I think projects are really important as well as discussions in these things. Last word to. Uh, I really don't know how to conclude because I keep repeating myself. Uh, I'm doing my little two bits because I'm, I'm getting old. I, I'm stretching to retire, so I'll stretch again next year. So, uh, but uh, small ways, I agree. I, th I think you, you will create small spaces, uh, do, doing some small things. Uh, I've been trying to influence the university to give faculty credit for team teaching. Yeah. Even that yeah. is hard yeah. here. Uh, to count a course for both of them, right? or to al allocate more, a little bit more money for creative workshops in order to bring about faculty from different departments to talk together, to have a project, to have a workshop leading for a kind of project, rather than to have this big mammoth conferences which tires everybody out uh, because you have to show output. A conference is an output. A workshop is a process, it's not. Uh, so, so that probably can be done uh, if, for instance, uh, your school of media initiate a series of uh, uh, workshops leading toward a project or in the name of a project the nature of which is precisely to link up people from architecture, journalism, humanity. If you have such a space, I will join. Uh, but I cannot initiate. I'm too old to initiate. I've been trying to get younger people to, to do that. I'm pretty old, but I can help out to <laughs> Scott is always welcome back. Because you have more energy than all of us. Yeah. Be really happy to uh, work with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm bringing people in from right. five, five or six, four or five departments, right. and Leo, of course, is the seventh person, and maybe a few other uh, universities to get yeah. something going relatively soon. Really but another way I'm trying to, to sell, to, to propose, is to follow the scientist model. So far, I've met with no success. Who's when you model? write an article, why don't you have several names together? Who's, who's model? For instance, if you want to publish an article, yeah. if you have a group of work for so workers, everybody puts his name on it. Because uh, it's the scientist model, right? Yeah. You have the you have science somebody science writes science. a lab. You know, a member of the lab writes a paper and submits to nature for it and gets published. You have eight names there. The guy who writes it together with his co workers together with his professors and everything, because they're all together. Why can we not do it in the humanities and social science? That presupposes the idea that you have a group, and a group is in constant interaction with each other. We help each other's research. I'm trying to realize that in Taiwan. It's near success. It's almost, so far, the government doesn't accept this joint authorship. That's the only option. Otherwise, you know, they're doing their help each other. Just a group of younger scholars. They meet once a month. People are doing different things. Whenever I have time, I will join them. Uh, if we have that, if you keep this going for a year or two, uh -huh. everybody aiming at helping everybody else. So hopefully, eventually, you can all be, you can come back to bureaucratic counting, all right? Every article is counted, whether I whether I actually written the article or not, but I'm a member of this group, I have a little credit. Mm -hmm. it's, to, it's to deconstruct the counting system. You have this SS social science index, find a way to deconstruct the index, <laughs> to make it more complicated, to, to get a deans to, to scratch your head, and say, how to count this one? <laughs> see, this, this is what it is, see. For instance, you know, all my, my publications are extra. They are neither academic, it's sort of semi-academic, maybe they are not. Uh, so you, you create things creatively. <laughs> that I really do not follow, fall into the mold. So I find that, the, the, even in my own case, uh, the more you follow the mold, the more you get stuck in it. Yeah. You, you keep it at a certain distance. You, know, you play hard and you follow it for a while, then you get out of it for a while. Uh, it's a little better. Because if I follow all the rules, 
then I have no free time. Uh, it's really endless like that. So what I do is uh, basically I call skip meeting. If I, can, <laughs> I, so if I go to meetings, no, if I go to meetings, I look at something. <laughs> you use every single trick to beat the system. If you cannot beat the system, is to create a certain form of constructive anarchy. Yeah. But at least you'll feel better. So at the very minimum, you will feel that I'm still me. <laughs> Suck into that system. Yeah. I was told that Chinese University is relatively better because they do not check what actually you teach. In some other universities, they even check your syllabus, everything, you know, every single hour you're teaching. So you can use one title and you teach something else. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> but every year I use a different topic. They do not check. Uh, so you can use one one course title. Right? You can fill this old bottle with new wine. You can end it in the teaching. So it becomes another, another you, you do not have to go through all the sort of, sort of bureaucratic stuff, you know, trying to propose and doing that. You have a meeting of that. That's the only way to do it. You, you start with guerrilla warfare, anarchy, and then hopefully the system will be shaking a little bit. It may not. It may not shake. Yeah. But at least I think I'm trying to save all of it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Uh,